Hello, everyone, wherever you are. We know you are tuning in from so many different parts of the world. Thank you, Charles, Jancis, Laura, and Martin for accepting our invitation. And thank you all to on the other side of the screen for joining us for another Climate Talk by Porto Protocol. Never losing the opportunity to introduce ourselves to those who are not acquainted with our work. We are an international foundation catalyzing climate action in the wine industry across the globe. As part of this quest, we are building an open network, a platform of change makers and climate solutions spread across the wine value chain. To build this meaningful, meaningful path, we rely on collaborative sharing, on doing it together with a growing community of members spread across the wine value chain from different regions, sizes, and different stages of climate action, sharing what they are doing to address climate crisis. We are not looking for perfection, we are looking for action. So consider this as an invitation to act and to join us. We would love to meet you and we are a click away. These climate talks are one of the ways we have of achieving this mission of ours, having people from different regions, profiles, companies, sharing their experiences, the best they have done and that they know. And when we started these climate talks a little less than a year ago, we brought this same topic. At the time, we called it the elephant in the room, sustainable packaging in wine. And at the time, we invited VA Glass, Garson Wines and Crimson Wine Group. This time we called it climate in a bottle because it, was a give, it is a given fact that the weight of the bottle is by far the element that contributes the most to the carbon footprint of wine. In fact, it remains an elephant in the room. And for this talk, we embarked on a different approach by gathering three stakeholders of the wine value chain. And from the UK, we have Jancis Robinson, the world's most influential wine critic, journalist and wine writer, a master of wine, and an influencer amongst producers and consumers alike. She is also a strong and powerful advocate of sustainability in wine and on the issue of wine packaging. From the US, we bring you Charles Biller, an innovator in the world of wine, owner of Biller Wines and co-founder of the Gotham Project. Between one company and the other, Charles has been uh, using alternative to glass, to glass for more than 20 years, such as bag in box, cans, wine on tap, and more recently, reusable bottles. From Finland, we have Laura Varpasu, the sustainability manager at Alco, the national alcoholic beverage retailing monopoly in Finland. Alco has been actively acting on packaging issue and conducted various studies on the carbon footprint of wine containers and on consumer perceptions. Furthermore, it has set the organi an organization goal to reduce the carbon footprint of the packaging sold by 50% in 10 years. So watch out for this ambitious target. And hosting this conversation, we, is, we have Martin Reis. First of all, and we take this opportunity to acknowledge it, he is a very cherished member of ours to whom we are great, grateful for his engagement, for helping us think to make us questions and brainstormings that have enabled us to grow as an organization. Martin is the founder of the Ray's Wine Group and the first Latin America to become a master of wine. So without further ado, I pass on the stage to you guys. Martin, you have the word. Thank you and I'll disappear from now. You know, just imagine a parallel universe, Earth 2021, and imagine in this parallel universe, wine was just invented last year. Nobody knew a thing about it before the pandemic. And we just learned that grapes make this excellent elixir that's a particularly useful coping mechanism during COVID-19. And as it grows in popularity in 2021, the industry forms and we say, wow, how, do we, how does the wine trade figure out how to get this beautiful libation packaged and shipped to new consumers across the world? What choices would wineries make when there's a blank canvas, where there's no preconceptions on packaging whatsoever? How much glass would we use, particularly heavy glass, in these days with what we know about climate change right now? Do we think perhaps those things we now call alternative packagings would become central and would become the majority in this parallel universe? When we recognize the, the carbon footprint of our packaging, I wanna make sure we set the record straight. And that is the, the, the story I wanna share with you today and have uh, our panelists and our guests deep dive into this topic. 
I want to share just one, one quick slide before we jump into the conversation. And uh, primarily because this is a, a shocker to a lot of people. So here we go. Let's share this. Oops. That's not what I want to do. Pardon me. I'm going to try once, once more here. My apologies. If you take a look at this slide where we have <clears throat> uh, the life cycle of the, of the wine, you can see how most of us focus on this part, the one quarter really that the vineyard impacts on carbon footprint. We also have a bit of the winery, but if you look at the single largest, single largest choice that a winery produce, a producer makes, the glass bottle is about 29%. A third, almost, our decisions really are dramatic when it comes to what the packaging that we can choose and the current model right now where the glass is, 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 um, is created, made, bottled, and then shipped heavier than other alternative packaging is quite impressive. So I wanted to, uh, at the same time, I don't want to say that glass is evil and that it is the, uh, it's a, some, something scary. I wanted to actually say it's a conundrum. It's a beautiful, elegant product. It's protective. It's inert. Long-term storage is possible. It's, it is recyclable if we do it right, but it's also it also is inefficient and it's carbon intensive as Marta has pointed out. So uh, Charles, I wanted to bring you in because I know that when we spoke, um, you have an, a strong opinion about the role that glass has played and will continue to play even with these facts. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm all for the range of alternative packages. You know, I, I produce bag and box. I produce wine in cans. I produce uh, wines in kegs. Uh, my company, Gotham Project, pioneered it in the United States. Um, and they all play a role. Um, I, I, I see two challenges. Number one, um, particularly with bag and box, Tetra cans, the, uh, the shelf life is limited. They don't, you know, beyond a year, there is serious um, oxidation and uh, a negative evolution that occurs with current technology. Um, and, and number two, um, glass is the standard. It's, um, it represents the majority of what people choose. And um, I don't see that changing quickly. And I, I just see um, limits to how, how many restaurants will put a uh, system in to serve wine from kegs. I see a limit to the price points that people will buy wines in Tetra or bag and box or cans for that matter. So we keep bumping into what are we going to do about glass? And, you know, the, the way I often think of it is, you know, at the end of a meal at home, right? We, we wash our plates, we wash our forks and knives and we, you know, we clean our pots. And then we take our wine bottle that's now empty, a wine that we loved and enjoyed, and we toss it away. Uh, and yet this bottle is probably just as pristine, other than the label that's on it, than the moment it went on the bottling line. Granted, a little dirtier at this point, but all things that can be addressed. So um, I've been increasingly interested in, in how we can use the infrastructure that, I, that, that my company has developed to deal with uh, the reverse logistics of kegs, taking an empty, dirty keg um, and uh, pick it up, return it to a point where we clean it and then refill it. Uh, if we can do that with kegs, uh, surely we can do it with glass as well. So we're, um, you know, it, it will require consumer action. It will, it will require a consumer to uh, return the bottle. I, I'll just give uh, one interesting fact. In the state of Maine, in the Northeast of the US, small state that maybe many on this, uh, on this chat don't know much about, but they have a very strong bottle bill in the United States, only about 30% um, of glass is actually recycled. In the state of Maine, they pay 15 cents uh, for wine bottles on the return. And there is a 90% return rate. So I think, um, you know, in addition to having the availability of, of this reverse logistics, having an incentive um, to, to do that is, is a part of it. So Again, I, I believe in the, in the broad range, but, but I think we got to address glass as well. 
Thank you, Charles. And you know, in that parallel universe, uh, I know that Jancis, you've written quite a bit about how things might look, right? Uh, if you paint that picture, could you t take us into your thoughts about, uh, you know, different oh. formats, different contexts, and so forth? Sure, sure, sure. I, th I think we've got to realize that wine is not just one product. The sort of wines that you know you and I sweated over in our Master of Wine exams, <laughs> and the sort that we write about on JancisRobinson.com are actually quite a small subsection of the entire wine market. Um, and that the, the, if, we, if we feel as members of the, the wine community that we need to reduce wine's contribution to the earth's carbon footprint, what a fantastic contribution we'd make if we could persuade mass market producers and mass market consumers to look at alternatives because there really is no need for m most wine to be in glass. Of course, top, top wine has to be in glass because it needs aging and it needs an inert material. But um, I think in the US, the figure is 90% of all wine is drunk within two weeks of purchase. And I would guess most of that wine is young wine. It hasn't been sitting around before. And if we could just, um, re-channel a substantial proportion of that 90%, we would make such a difference to wine's contribution. Um, and I actually feel thinking about, I'm now thinking about how to introduce people to wine, that the 75 centiliter bottle, which incidentally is a very spatially inconvenient shape. There's a heck of a lot of, of space left in any container or box full of bottles. Um, it's a bit of a deterrent for many young potential wine drinkers. I've heard people say this and, oh, if only it were available in at a 25 centiliter can, I could afford it. I could try it. I wouldn't feel I'd be making such a commitment. So it's really at the bottom end of the market, which constitutes the great volume that I would love to see a change. As well, of course, as reducing bottle weights on in, on the smarter wine, but perhaps that's a, a topic for later in our discussion. Absolutely, we, we, do, we will come back to um, uh, diving into the alternative packaging with, uh, with a bit more um, attention. Can I say bit, something quickly, Martin? Please, Just, yes. Uh, challenging, challenging you. Listen, Jancis, I, I, I don't disagree, um, but we're, you know, we need to recognize um, you know, how important it is for a lot of people, the, the visual impact of a beautiful bottle on your table as you share it amongst friends. And, and it's so, you know, it's easy to say, okay, um, big producers, um, you know, put it all in bag and box, put it all in paper bottles, put it all, but at the end of the day, you know, the consumer needs to pick it up. And, and, I, and I think, you know, I, it's obviously, um, you know, we, we all need to work at this and both sides need to, to be engaged, but, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're, I don't think we're just going to win this through alternative packaging. I think we, we have to. We can carry on with this all. We mustn't hold okay. anything, but um, we are responsible for creating this idea that the bottle on the table with the candle is magic. If there was more promotion of wine, which showed cool people with cans, even with bag and box, better packaging, uh, I do think we could change perceptions. And if I could also jump in about your admirable uh, plans for totally, um, what do you call them, recyclable bottles? Yeah, the, about, yeah. Re returnable, returnable. Yeah, returnable. That works in a given market, in a country. It wouldn't work, say, for us Brits who import most of our wine. Well, though, as, if, as you've noted, I mean, the, the UK has uh, an exceptional domestic bottling program so, in fact, if there's a country that's best suited for it, um, it's you. You know, yes, the, the... that would work. But it, but all the wine that's in the 45 percent of wine imports into the UK that come in in bulk are that kind of bottom end where we could really, I think, change our carbon footprint total. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's clear. It's clear based on even that potential uh, uh, prism of, of of debate that there that there isn't a perfect solution. And there's a question that came up here that, that I think segues into uh, telling, uh, uh, having a sense of what Laura wants to say. But somebody says, do you think that lightweight bottle is a good alternative or not good enough? I don't necessarily, well, I want to make sure that the guests answer this question, but to set the stage, do we really think that there is 
a, a choice or is it a false choice to say good enough versus um, one of the alternatives based upon the context and based upon the use and based upon whether it's an import or otherwise. Laura, I know that you, um, you are, this, you are um, with Alco, right, with, with, uh, with Finland, and you have dramatic, um, your role as a dramatic sustainability uh, uh, director uh, there. And uh, tell us about the packaging, tell, frankly, answer this question if you like. Is it good or good enough? And what do you use? Maybe is there Garcon or a few other things that you find are particularly suited for a particular customer? Uh, well, um, in the middle of all this wine expertise and going back so many decades, I I'm, feel very humble and just the sustainability manager, of course. So I may be, I'm not the right person to comment on which package would suit which consumer or, or which need exactly there. There is a lot more knowledge uh, with the other people here. Uh, and also I very strongly see that there is no one solution, which is very typical in sustainability questions overall. Because if you, you are perfect in one way, you, you may miss some very important other perspective, perspectives. And um, I have certain favorites, um, be, being from Monopoly, I can't perhaps list them all here because it's not uh, like our official view or anything, but but my, my very strong favorite is whatever material it is that it would already contain recycled material, because that is the only way we can close the loops and we can utilize what already is out there. We don't need to create and, and pull from the nature new material all the time, but use what we already have. And of course, we know there are already good examples out there in the market that, that producers have started adopting. And I think that's, that's the way to go. So kind of regardless of the material, that's, that's something that will maybe save us. So generally, I feel like, Charles, did you want to say something? You want to jump in? No, okay. I mean, I could, but. <laughs> uh, well, you know, generally what we recognize today, there's probably two roles that, two layers of conversation today. One is that there is an education an awareness of the impact that packaging plays. And from glass to alternatives to reusable recycling schemes, re, re, uh, reusable schemes will come back to at, towards the end, which I know is, is fascinating. And then the consumer perceptions. The second part really is, which we'll cover in a little bit too, is, is about action, about the opportunities and the hurdles of implementation, right? And what the responsibilities is of the trade. So um, there's a lot there. So what I don't want to, to necessarily do is deep dive into the debatable which one is better but rather let's consider the fact that there are many alternatives for particular reasons and that uh you know the the uh, uh the Quinterno Barolo that should be late for 30 years is just not the appropriate it's not the appropriate uh, packaging cans won't be the approach you can put them in but you you might not like the results and uh so I think that there's Otherwise, if you monopolize the conversation, uh, if we go into which one is better. Um, I do want to, to, to go back to Charles because you have you touched on the reusable scheme. I know that the Jans has mentioned that there are some challenges there and there have been some chats around different places we've used in London, Catalonia has used, uh, Finland of course has used the reusable schemes. There are hurdles, right? Oh, so do, oh there are so many hurdles. <laughs> you know, there about... are so many hurdles. Well, actually I, I'm trying to follow along some of these, the chat which is coming in Fast and Furious. Right. There are a lot of great comments about labels uh, and how and, and getting the labels off. And it, and it is a challenge. And we are experimenting with um, different glues, different paper types, different ways of, of applying. And, and the funny thing is, we're actually ending up going back to the traditional wet glue application, which, you know, if you stick it in a, a bucket of water for, for many hours, it may start peeling off at the end. We all right. remember that, right? All that, that's, that's just the way it was. And it was kind of charming. It, it helped um, you, you know, get the, the label into your, into your scrapbook. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, um, you, you know, th those are, you know, we're, we're early into this. So um, we're, we're having to experiment um, across the board and, um, uh, but li labels, uh, labels are a factor. And I might add, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the effectiveness of labels today are also a problem when it comes to recycling. It also, it results in a lot of glass that's rejected. You know, we, we, and we should talk about that, 
you know, again, I, I'm, I can only speak for, for North America, but, um, you know, the, the recycling market is collapsing. There is, uh, there's not, uh, there are not many buyers for it. Uh, cities and states are having to pay to haul glass away. They're not, um, they're not as many downstream uses. Um, and a lot of it is increasingly ending up in the landfills. Uh, part of it, again, has, you know, has to do with the, you know, these labels as a factor they're sticking on and the capsules that are targeted. It's, it's not an immaculate way to, uh, to, to clean this up. I, you know, to all on, on, on the range of alternative products besides glass, if I just may comment quickly, um, I think an area where we could uh, really advance things bag and box is, is certainly establishing itself as a, a strong, strongly growing category in the, I'll speak again in, in the United States. Um, uh, but it's been pretty limited in price point, and there there are efforts to try to escalate it, and, and you are seeing it creep up. But I, I uh, that that's another area that our company, the Gotham Project, is experimenting with. Um, you know, single vineyard, small batch, uh, one point five liter bag and box, and to pushing the limits on on price points, uh, which um, I, I I think there's more and more comfort with the format. Um, but it's it's an area where we need to. Uh, I mean, chances to, to, your, to your point, we need to advertise that this is um, not just an efficient way to go and a responsible way to go, but it's actually uh, kind of fantastic too and, and exciting and not something to be ashamed about. So, um, yeah, you know, Jensis, I want to, oh, sorry, you were about to say, please jump in. Sorry, I just want to, I wonder what we as, as representing the wine industry can do to, to improve this recycling situation because it's pretty key to an, a lot of what we want to do. Can, uh, and as the major users of glass bottles, can we lobby, it's a government question really, isn't it? It's a local government or a national government. Um, can we somehow lobby our, our governments to pull up their socks? And I mean, they, 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 they all sort of talk the talk, don't they? And about how they're gonna reduce emissions and oh, we're marvelous, but mm -hmm. this is something really concrete that they could do. There are potentially there are, there are pieces to this, right? There is there is the consumer perception and demand which would push that. There's the and what I was going to bring up earlier, uh, Jancis, you 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 essentially are are staring at the problem right in its face, and that is there is a structural resistance, and it's built on many many levels potentially. If I were to I, I produce wine, I make wine, and I still bottle it in regular glass. Uh, doesn't matter what wine it is; it's just what I do. Why, why don't I change to kegs now? Why don't I change to bag and box myself? I, I, I don't want to. I choose not to for all kinds of reasons. Logistical, I have to change, start over from scratch, which is why that parallel universe thing is if I did, I would start over from scratch in a very different format. So there are these, res there's, there's these structure, structural resistances, supply chain, right, where Everything's built around the 12 bottles in a cardboard box with loads of waste around it and the slots in the retail shops and the slots in the restaurants, right? And the whole sommelier community is built around opening a bottle of 750 glass. Can you imagine if most of it was not, you know, they'd have to retrain everybody. So, and then ultimately, uh, Jancis perhaps, and really you brought, you brought the, 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 the movement here is structural change, governmental and so forth. What are, and ultimately, who's responsible? Who collectively, how do we get that to happen? Any ideas? Any thoughts? You know, I, I, I know um, of a few states that um, I'll speak of Vermont, for example, is trying to pass a, a wine, um, a, a redemption program that will include wine bottles and, uh, and also at the same time trying to figure out um, uh, an, an alternative use for what the glass becomes once it's ground up. And there's discussion about using it in, in roads and in alternatives. And that's part of the discussion. I, I, I know some other states are, are eliminating using glass in, in road material, but um, it, it's, I, I think, you know, um, it's sort of carrot and stick stuff, you know, lead, help people move along, give some sort of, um, I think, re redemption um, to, to encourage, again, in the U.S., it's a pathetic 30% of glass is actually recycled. And that the number I've understood is 10% of the U.S. landfill by weight is glass. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we've, we've got a long, we've got a lot of improving we got to do. 
but I think I think a political involvement is that that's a that's an important part, and it, it's federal and state, at least in the U.S. You've it's you've been Alora, you were going to say as as well. <laughs> yes, uh, two points. Uh, maybe um, to encourage all you producers uh, in this conversation. Um, uh, firstly, of course, the Nordic market, which you may know very well, is a, a wonderful testing playground for all these things because we are we have such a short history on wine. We are not wine countries, and our consumers typically are quite open. To new stuff and and i think this is way beyond my time with alcohol but the screw cap for instance was very well uh, adopted in the nordics because come on why not so we don't have all that legacy that maybe maybe some other countries have so uh go go ahead and offer us these things and then the other point um, I wanted to tell you about was a, a customer survey we ran uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it feels like another life being way, way before Corona pandemic and, and, and everything we live in the middle of now, but, but about two years ago. Uh, and we had 2,500 respondents, more or less, nearly half and half women and men. And, and we asked these people their choice of wine bottles uh, and the choices were heavy glass, lighter glass and PET plastic. And what we did, we, we first asked them what they would choose and then we told them about the climate impact of these choices. And you know, they actually changed their minds with the lighter glass, um, six times more respondents would choose the lighter glass once they knew about the carbon footprint. And with PET, it was double. So smaller change and not nearly as ready to buy a plastic bottled wine, but still. Of course, they then had these kind of thoughts in their minds that maybe not in all, all occasions. So as a gift, for instance, they, they wouldn't choose a plastic bottle or, or in a very you know, valuable party setting, for instance. But still, they were receptive to the information. They are willing to think again. We're waiting into we the subject that survey again because it's it's two years is a long time. Right, we're waiting into the subject about consumer awareness and education, and this this ties directly to a question that was asked about lighter and heavier glass perceptions, right? And you just said right now you've essentially answered the question: How do we change? How do we reshape the notions that quality uh, uh, it comes in heavier glass? We're afraid. I think the industry is afraid. Right, especially here close to, I live here very close to Napa, those bottles are pretty heavy. And even the mo I know several uh, producers who are very gun ho about their uh, GHG greenhouse gas emissions that have yet to change their glass. And it's a fair question. And therefore, um, yeah, what is the role that uh, the media, the writers, communicators have to reshape this? Any thoughts that you might have, uh, Jancis? Well, I was just remembering that the first time I wrote an article on this subject of bottle weight, it was called Down with Bodybuilder Bottles, and it was way back in 2006. So I'm not a strong influence, obviously. I keep banging on about it, but you know, I'm just one voice. But recently, actually, we've started weighing every bottle that we taste at home, which has been quite, we've been tasting a lot at home, obviously, during the pandemic. And it's quite extraordinary how uh, varied the bottle weights are. So far, the, the prize to the, to the lightest bottle goes to uh, the biggest exporter from Romania, Crameli Rec uh, Recas. Their bottle is 340 grams. And the, 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 um, the really bad, um, I tasted a couple of Burgundies the other day that were nearly a, a kilo. The bottles were nearly a kilo. I and mean, that is not Burgundy, is it? That's, ridiculous. Um, but it's worth remembering that if the first growths of Bordeaux, Chateau Latour, for instance, which is very green, very biodynamic, horses in the vineyard and all the rest, that's 590 grams for the last time. That, but that was actually the 2013 vintage. And I wouldn't mind betting that they're using a lighter bottle nowadays, that with every vintage, they're, they're light weighting. Uh, you know, it, it, you don't have to signal wine quality with a heavy bottle. 
Oh, and the other um, real naughtiness was in uh, Moldova. There was an 860 gram bottle from Moldova. You know, I was almost going to wear a shirt that says like lighter, light bottles are sexier. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, That's maybe, the key. <laughs> how, do we, how do we do that? That's what and we're missing, Mark. One of yours, Charles, uh, Charles, Sidney. <laughs> Charles Sidney says hello, by the way, and an email you sent last night. And he mentioned that, that Sweden was, had talked about, um, you know, uh, taxing uh, an extra euro and everything over 400. And there's just some thoughts about whether that's too much or not enough. And then your comments around the nasty, heavy bottles, uh, you know, that's pushing the, the, the effect. Do we feel like weighing the glass within the markets that do you think, do we think that's an answer? So we put a spotlight on it and say, look at how much this is and it's lighter or sexier. Is that one yeah. way to do it? Do you remember Raj Parr had this big campaign about not listing wines that were over 14% percent alcohol, alcohol? Yeah. Which yeah. actually did have, I think you could say it had an effect. I mean, you- it was, it was um, controversial, but yes. Controversial, yeah. yes. I mean, you could, you know, there could be some kind of really um, ecologically, uh, environmentally aware retailers who might say, I'm not listing, I'm not taking bottles that weigh more than such and such. Yeah, well, the monopolies have a, have a great opportunity to do that. And, yeah. and as we discussed, you know, Canada, LCBO in particular, I'm assuming the Nordics are, are doing uh, similarly that, you know, if you want to be on the LCBO, offering under what I think it's 1295 it has to be I'm making this up but it's something like 400 grams or under there's very specific and if it's if it's over that you're gonna have to sell at a higher price point and um, so that that I, I really applaud that effort we, we have a question about the fact even though we're talking about a lightweight which is the lowest hanging fruit we would all agree that's the one thing we can change as producers oh. mm -hmm. that is um, easy the harder part are alternative packaging and the hardest part still would probably be the recycling, uh, sorry, excuse me, the uh, reusable scheme. Hey, Martin, let me just say it, it's easy in this conversation to say, oh, sure, we'll just go for a lighter glass. It'll be great. It, you know, here are all the benefits. But I mean, there's a reason you're not doing it with your uh, with your bottle, not to call you out here. I don't even know how I much your bottle lighter. weighs. I didn't change did the, you? I didn't change the glass. I did go lighter. Yeah. About all right, well, good for you. I th there, but I mean, there there is a consumer consequence. Yeah. You know, the you know, there there it's it's not fabricated. I mean, consumers I mean, supply chain being easy. I don't mean that it's perceptually easy, which I, I recognize. Thanks for pointing that out, Charles. Mm -hmm. uh, chances? Sorry, yeah. I would. I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned screw caps, Laura, because that's a good example of where consumer perceptions were changed, certainly in, in distinct markets, in the Nordics, in Australia and New Zealand. You can, you can hard, you, you, there's hardly a corkscrew in the whole of Australia nowadays. Um, the consumers were told there is a very good reason that we're using screw caps and they learnt it and they adapted their, um, their perceptions. If, if consumers really were effectively told um, what contribution glass bottles were making to carbon footprint, I think that it, there is a good chance of changing perceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles, a question for you about how heavy your, are your refillable bottles? I was going to ask, that was where yeah, I was that's going. That's a great question. Ask. So, yeah. so out of necessity, our, our returnable bottles are heavier. They are about 600 grams. Um, we needed to be able to, need it to withstand the banging around as it's dropped off and shipped back and, and redone. You know, our um, our, our uh, box, our cartons are uh, two times the thickness of regular cardboard so that they can be reused along, along the chain. But it's, a, it's, a, it's very purposeful in, in this case. Um, so we, we recognize that um, you know, up front, um, there's a bigger uh, carbon footprint consequence, but downstream, um, we get it back and then some. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, logistical challenges, some of them which have been heavily explored. There's websites of different places like Cata the Catalunian Rewind, uh, a reusing, reusing scheme where they've thought these challenges through. We recognize, it's, uh, we recognize that the, the, the biggest opportunity is where it's a local community, a smaller area. Uh, Laura, you mentioned that. There's a friend of mine, Rocio from Mexico, who mentioned that in Mexico, there was just the expectation that the bottles for Coke, right, were just, it was just what happened. And mm -hmm. Nobody was thinking green to that degree that we are now, and it was just what was expected. It's a thought, right? A, a transitional thought there. And uh, Laura, uh, Laura, I think that you had mentioned 
one of the keys is that there's a difference between, and Janice is you too, that imported versus local, right? So the reusable scheme wouldn't necessarily work, work for everything, would it, Laura? Uh, no, no, it wouldn't. And, and at the moment in Finland, I think there are maybe one or two beers really that come in reusable bottles because we also ramp down the all the infrastructure for the washing and all the logistics some decades ago. And um, maybe if it would, would be a kind of producer owned and branded system, like what Charles is, is uh, creating, uh, it might work with the bigger producers or uh, importers and producers in Finland. It might work. But I think there are also the keys that the consumer knows. And I really like you, Charles, you had the text on the bottle, didn't you? That it says we did, re yeah. reuse. And yeah, it's it very, very clear. Very yeah, very clear, very simple. <laughs> because otherwise you wouldn't, you know, be able to tell it from the next product. You know, you wouldn't be able to appreciate the, you know, the good thinking that went into the process. So, so I think we, we in all stages should also be thinking of how, how do we always remember to tell the consumer and not assume that they would know already. And, and the, the small starts that we have done over for, for our assortment is to just put a label on the price tag that this product is an environmentally responsible packaging. And it can be like a glass, but it also can be certified material whether it's it's a, a wood fiber then it would come with an fsc the forest standard or whether it's recycled vet it would come with a with a certification of origin so the consumer needs to be seeing it with their own eyes that this is different and this is what i want to then choose so the role about the role of education awareness continues and i think it even has. so even so, I was thinking that there is a there is a recent uh, dissertation, this is, um, research paper from Melissa Saunders, a newly minted master of wine owner of communal brands in New York, and she has uh, something called Wine Queen, which is around sustainable uh, consulting for wine. And her thesis, um, hopefully it's public, at least what the basis was, was the knowledge and perception of the retail buyers in New York, one of the most mature markets in the world for wine, right? And their perception of their of what green what the carbon footprint was of packaging and then if they what they would do as an action if they learn if they were more educated one of the things that came out of that was that they that they all generally agree that there was not that they educated wine professional buyers were not actively thinking about this question and that they had assumptions that were gut assumptions or what they heard on the news and then compared to the reality there was no basis for that reality and they were learning. And some of them even said, gosh, based upon this questionnaire, Melissa, I might, I might change, or I might look at these decisions uh, from, from, a, uh, from a buyer's perspective. But if the consumer, if, if the retailer doesn't really know what is a hurdle for the consumer and if the consumer is going to be alienated by their, you know, a ba a bag in box, uh, uh, Gigondas or Chateau of the Pop, where is, how does this role break down in terms of influencing and creating critical mass for change? I, I have a lot of faith in the, the uh, millennials and, and the Gen Zers coming up. Um, you know, they, the ones that I know, my 16 year old daughter and, 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 and of the drinking age, they all wander around with a, uh, a reusable water bottle. They all, you know, they walk around with a reusable straw, metal straw. They, you know, this is all sort of second nature to them. And I, um, I think the real change can happen with that crowd demanding um, that the stores that they frequent um, have these sort of options. Um, and so that's, it's going to take some time. And, um, and, I, and I, I think it's for them in many cases, the, you know, the thermos that they carry around is a, is a, is a badge of honor. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, one of the reasons why in, in our returnable bottle, we have the big return and reuse on it is uh, we want it to, to be kind of sexy and exciting. Mm. Um, and um, that's, you know, I think, you know, play into this visual stimulus that's so important um, has been traditionally important uh, with wine. Talking of consumer perceptions, has anyone seen that there's a new uh, range of wines from a 
group of sisters in Oregon, the daughters of Owen Rowe. Um, and it's called No Men, because there are no men involved. And it's all in PET, rather very smart looking PET bottles. And I, was, I asked them what the reaction had been. And they said they were most amazed by the favorable reaction from consumers. And it's quite recently launched this. Um, and they, they, they had very positive uptake and some people were reordering 10 times in three months. But admittedly, that's Oregon, which is a sort of right on state, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's a start. I, I think we need to get more commitment um, from, from retailers in particular in, in the U.S. and bottle shops, too. Like, I, I have the belief that a retailer can really sell whatever they want from whatever country, whatever varietal. Um, and uh, if they stack it up and put it in front of the store and force the consumer to confront it, and then that they actually follow up with some uh, information why. I know, you know, going back to the, you know, my origins, um, producing rosé with my father from, from Provence and trying to establish a rosé market um, in the United States in, you know, in 1999, which was completely hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the breakthrough was when the retailers um, took the bottles away from the bottom shelf in the back corner where there was loads of dust and it was usually many vintages old and put the fresh stuff in front of the consumer when they walked in and forced the conversation. And, um, and, and with that, the change was, was pretty dramatic and pretty immediate. So we, um, yeah, I, I, we, I think, you know, we need to engage the, the trade increasingly, like you need to do your part if you believe in this. Um, and I think we should all believe in this. Um, you know, we have to force this conversation. We need to bridge it to the, to the consumer. Are you saying that if the, the re, if the supply chain was able to uh, convince us all that natural wines are, are awesome, that they can do that with sustainable wines too, right? <laughs> are we going to uh, talk about natural wine, Martin? No, no, no. I just, but that, that's, a, <laughs> it was, it was a thing that did, the consumer wasn't asking about. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Right. It was a thing that, that producers themselves and then retailers like Henry Salmi's and everything. Laura, you, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, about um, about the sales, uh, point of sales. Just thinking when when Charles, you were you were talking about that that it it really is something that we also should be doing more on based on my few days uh, on the shop floor where I'm nothing, you know, not very good at all. But still, it is frightening how much I can sell just by talking to the. Customer and say that have you tried this? It comes okay. in a PT bottle. Try how light it is, and and they go for it. So yeah, as you say, totally, the retail has has a lot of power. In a monopoly, of course, it comes with certain obligations. We can't do no matter what. We we need to be equal and, and treat everybody the same. Our suppliers, uh, but still, I think we have the role of being the informed gatekeepers. And in the future, I hope that we will be able to, to uh, introduce programs where with the equal conditions to all suppliers, of course, um, to, to do more of that. For instance, a, a, a sustainable product could not lo no longer come in a very heavy glass bottle. So kind of exclude certain combinations that we still have in the assortment. And, and in the Nordic countries, we of course represent about 20 million uh, consumers and and we have the same goals in in all all our monopolies so so we we should be doing more i'm totally aware so are you saying that if this is somewhat hopeful uh, very hopeful you're saying that if retailers have uh, no reason to be afraid and we have positive uh, anecdotal evidence here uh, then do producers who are making the decisions at bottling, whether they choose to bottle close to themselves or, or in a different location, that they, we, all of us do not need to be afraid either to make those decisions. Even if our clientele has historically not been someone who we talk to about this issue. That's been my, that's been my concern too, you know. I think that'll open it up for sure. I mean, we, you know, we see it with, with I think every trend it's, retailers getting behind it stacking it up forcing the conversation and they can sell whatever they want right and, and if it's good and it makes sense people come back 
It seems as though, uh, one question I want to ask uh, to everybody here, it seems as though whenever the conversation centered around wine quality always leads, right? And the story of the, of the, of the vineyard, story of, of the obsession around quality, and it trumps the environment or the, 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 the sustainable aspects every single time. Head to head, there's, there's no match, right? Both from the retailer, excuse me, the, the retailer too, from the producer and the consumer who's asking, what's the clone? What's the rootstock? What did you use, right? And so um, do we say that, that, uh, that, we, that producers will have to take a step off the limb of the tree and say, no, I'm not gonna talk to you about, qual or, or is our quality obsession taken too far where we think, uh, you know, it needs to be reined in and we say, yes, this is good wine, but it's more than that. Well, just think how much PR there is about being organic or biodynamic or at the least sustainable. I mean, the producers have gone that far and they've put two and two together and realized that is a positive selling point. They just need to be made more aware. That, that diagram that you started off with just needs to be shown much, much more widely. And I think, I may be wrong, but I think it's actually quite recent, isn't it? That, that particular analysis that, um, you know, it hasn't, that, that hasn't been around for all that long. So we've just yeah. got to keep Two years, yeah, maybe five, 10 years, I think, five, six years. Yeah, yeah not too long. And, and the, yeah, no, it's, it's the relatively- The arena, yeah. Now, what, something we haven't talked about a lot right now, and this was on the subject matter, was cork and the, and the role that cork can play to offset uh, uh, carbon footprint. Uh, wanted to see if there's any thoughts that the panel wanted to share about that. Well, uh, my understanding is it's sort of a, it's sort of a, since the aluminum cap, if we're talking about it versus screw cap, is that how you're thinking of it? You know, which is it's recyclable. It's right sort now. of a, it's sort of a, a trade. It's sort of, it's sort of neutral cork versus. Um, maybe you all have better information. I, you know, I, I know in the case of our uh, return and reuse bottles, we're going for glass. Or excuse me, a cork for the main reason that the the uh, the screw cap threads could are are quite narrow and could break with re reuse. So um, we we need to ensure that the bottle holds up. That's our decision making there. It's not a carbon footprint one. There's the cork forest argument too, isn't there? That it, cork forests are part of the ecosystem and uh, should be kept going. Um, who, you, who, uh, who recycles all their corks? I mean, I faithfully take my corks along to some, somebody who says that they recycle them, but I have no clue how cork recycling actually works and or if it does i have huge bags of corks that i haven't I have one day my craft project with my kids that's <laughs> laura martin i even did one craft project once but now i i sit with the bags also <laughs> in finland yeah. there is no system for recycling them this is more yeah. we'd need to sort of put more effort behind this whole recycling business whether it's glass or cork the effort and I'm of, afraid uh, um, if you... go ahead Laura yes and just you know a notion that um, I'm afraid um, no matter how wonderful the cork is as a material it doesn't save the big picture it's still in the glass bottle now do we feel like we've answered this uh, question or is there more to dis uh, to dive into about the role that who who will who should play the educator's role is and how is it best played for things like court, things like reusable, things like rescheme, everything, recycling pushes. Well, if we take Charles's excellent point, uh, backed up by Laura, who, who says she can sell anyone anything on the shop floor, if any luck. <laughs> um, Did then, you say that? <laughs> <laughs> then arguably uh, there's a big role for the, tr the wine trade media to be communicating properly to, to retailers and to producers as well. Um, it, those of us who write for the public can, can do our bit as well in parallel, but I think trade media definitely need to get behind this. And maybe the educators as well. You know, the vast numbers of 
WSET instructors at, all around the world and um, people doing MW courses, you know, that, that they're at the nub of changing perceptions and changing behavior. We have uh, uh, questions coming from um, countries that are not traditionally seen as uh, very um, mature or even adolescent in their in their notions from India, Brazil, and Mexico, several people. Hola, Mexico, como están? Uh, and really, the question really comes down to they, these are, they're starting out the conversations where a lot of the consumer public is just learning about the grapes. They're learning to transition to the new questions that are being asked that we, I shouldn't say we, that the UK and the US and other, other markets have been asking, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago about who makes, what is it? Uh, how do you taste it? How do you pair it? Right there, there is that. So, what? How would those countries, and the, and the trade and the, uh, yeah, the, the trade and the and the thought leaders in those countries, deal with this when they are when there's still a fundamental education going on. Maybe they're in a better place than we are because they haven't got centuries mm -hmm. of of consumption tradition and it's got to be in a bottle and that yeah. kind of thing. I'm thinking the same. There is this leapfrogging that they have done in other issues as well. For instance, renewable energies comes to mind. Um, and also I'm thinking of the influencers that Jancis, you mentioned earlier, that and all of us, we, we should keep on going on, on that because, the, the, you know, the funniest things can, can have such a, a, an impact somewhere behind, even if we don't even realize it, then I'm thinking of an analogy of, of why rosé wine became so popular. Somebody oh, yeah. said it's because it's so Instagrammable. It <laughs> looks so beautiful in the in the photo. So if we can, you know, do such things with different kinds of packages and make them look really, really desirable in, in you know, whatever our holiday pictures, you know, you name it, uh, we should keep going. Mm, I agree. One tiny little thing, um, uh, Richard Smart, who's based in Australia, a viticultural consultant, uh, has done a lot of writing and, and lo lobbying on this topic. And he, just as a side point, points out, if we're talking, I mean, the Porto Pro Protocol is about macro activity, isn't it? Action. Um, and one thing we should be aware of if we're looking at the whole wine sector is that the wine sector is still giving off the carbon dioxide from fermentation off into the atmosphere. And perhaps you've discussed this already on Porto Protocol, in which case I apologize, but there are ways of capturing it. And that would be one very concrete thing that producers could do. I know it's not packaging, but I, Richard asked me to mention it. So I have. Well, I think that's happening. I, I know there's certain pressure in California to, uh, and, and taxes if, if you don't uh, capture Good. it. Good. Uh, but I mean, it's early stages. And, I can't speak for the rest of the world. I don't think it's happening in Europe. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah no. There's that. That the, we we should recognize the 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 the, in, the powerful impact that organizations like Porter Protocol are doing to raise this awareness. The very fact that we're talking about this, that we're exploring, and that there are you know, there's an awareness that there that the solutions are imperfect, and yet they work in a certain period. That <coughs> excuse me. That that. Uh, uh, the fears uh, that we've all shared of trans transparency may be either unfounded or at least they're worth challenging or they're worth diving into. Um, and, uh, you know, even an example such as Jancis, you've spoken a lot on, this, on these subjects for many, many, for, for a long time. And you mentioned recently, somebody mentioned here in South Africa takes their quirks to recycling and other objects for resale and so forth, uh, decorative objects. But that really made me realize that you had talked glowingly about the South African producers that were bottling in cans. It's mm. worth just saying that, isn't it? Yeah. Talk about it. Um, I, well, I've just happened to notice that uh, the best wines I've tasted from can have been up to the standard of, of a wine I would happily drink with dinner. The only reason I don't take the cans to the dinner table, Charles, is that I've currently swamped with Bordeaux and uh, <laughs> it comes in a bottle, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a company there called Can Can, started by a, a winemaker, Francois Osbrook, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. 
and it seems to be churning out, sorry, churning out, it's probably the wrong verb, um, producing some really, really good quality stuff. Um, fellow master of wine, Richard Kelly is, is designing, or one of, a colleague of his, some superb label packaging so that it just looks really cool, really smart. Um, and it just happens to be in, an, in an, another package, but not a, an inferior one. And obviously, no, no. it's not, it's not going to last, you know, more than a year. But then, nor does ninety percent of the wine bought today. Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., their their can wine is is it has been exploding uh, from from you know just a few years ago, pretty much zero to every supermarket in the country now has um, a, at least a few a few brands. But but again, yeah, it's it's. Um, you know, the average grocery store, I would imagine it's the same at Tesco and the others, that the bag and box and the Tetra and the cans are, represent, I don't know, maybe 5% of the shelf space, you know, back in, in the corner. And there, there's not the commitment uh, to bring it up front and, and talk about it more than just sort of some convenience offering or value offering. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think we need to put a heck of a lot of pressure on, on the trade and, and, you know, encourage it as a way to differentiate themselves from, from their competitors and to speak to this, this Gen Z millennial uh, consumer who's coming up, who's, uh, who, who just is gonna demand more. So you wanna be relevant, um, you need to start uh, presenting a little bit differently. You know, as we wind down this uh, conversation, there's a lot of activity on the chat. Uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with, but there's a lot of either producers sommeliers, wine directors, uh, uh, ambitious activist consumers who are mentioning and who are pointing out uh, their, um, either their businesses or their questions that some of them we didn't get to today. Um, I'm, I would love for the, the people who are watching today to dive in there and, and potentially connect or reach out or, or grab uh, the screenshot of some, uh, some of the uh, both questions as well as comments that are, that are coming through here. Um, probably the last question that we have time for, and then, uh, or rather the last uh, a couple of minutes is that, uh, is, is there any way in which we can uh, prepare our empty wine bottles for recycling that will not let them be pulled out from the, from the, uh, uh, from the through, through flow of that labels or otherwise, or it's a good question. I don't know really the answer to that. How do we set ourselves up to yeah, well, you, you, what I'm understanding is it's it's state to state. There are different standards, different selection process. You know where commingling, recycling versus um, single stream. There um, single stream meaning you putting all your glass dropped in the same spot is generally much more successful. Less is pulled out. The commingling when it's with the cans and the plastic and all the others. I mean, you know, certainly if you can remove the tin. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody's going to scrape off the label. It's, it's hard work. Um, but, um, you know, where possible, single stream is, is, a, is a better option if, if you have that. So, um, and, and somebody have... just said on the chat, by the way, that I yes. was passing the buck to the retailer. Um, I, 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 I don't, I think it was Colleen. Um, and I, it may sound like I am. I'm just saying they're a really important piece of, of the communication. Um, you know, it would really help the consumer to connect the dots. There are a lot of suppliers who are, who, many of whom are already producing alternative packages and, and so forth, who, so they're, they're there. And then there are many more who are fearful to move into that while they may be very much inclined that way because they, they think that they limit, um, you know, the exposure that they're going to get in a store, and, and, which is the reality currently. Walk into any true? store and you see the alternatives they're not front and center. The, they're, they're in the back, they're clustered, and it's a, you, you, gotta, you, gotta go, you gotta go hunt for it. There are plenty of exceptions, but generally speaking. Any, any final thoughts from you, uh, Laura or Jancis? Well, uh, at least I must say that we plead guilty to the fact that yes, the alternative packages with the exception of the plastic bottles, they are somewhere else than the main wine aisles. I'm, I'm told, I'm so aware, <laughs> but we can't we can't figure that out. Maybe just just yet or very soon. 
um, but um, still a notion about uh, the recycling that I see it's been dis discussed a lot in the chat. Uh, that uh, there the key I think is the deposit because it gives the consumer the incentive to return the package whatever material it is and um, again a word of encouragement that at least in Finland it, it works very smoothly it's over 90 percent year after year that the, the PET is returned and because it is so pure it goes 100 percent to new bottles more or less and the, the, the great innovation there also that even that can be more lightweight. So the lightest that I have seen so far in wine is 10 grams. PET bottle, 10 grams. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Chances, mm. any final thoughts for you from you? Not really, no. I wonder what, what's the weight of this, the, the paper, the frugal pack, the paper bottle. That, that's probably less than 10, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, it'd be like a Tetra pack. It, it would, yeah, a bit it's, more. it's five grand. It's, it's, yeah. you know, you, you sell the, the, yeah. the cost of the, you know, you sell the weight of the wine. That's it. Yeah, right. exactly. Like an egg, a Tetra pack likes to say. Right. Well, so, I all, all I will say is I hope that there are lots of retailers and producers um, participating here. And, you know, they may not agree with everything, but that let's hope they take some of it in, not least that, diagram at the very beginning that you shared with us martin thank you very much right i should attribute that when i when i send that email out and we are now winding down it sounds as though we take it takes a village to raise a child but it takes an industry <laughs> to make sustainability central to our to our um, to our enjoyment thank so, you all you were amazing i think uh, there's a key two key ideas the industry is afraid there's no need to be afraid. I think I got this message from two of you. I think the role of education and, reta and retailers play a very important part in it. And also uh, somehow lobbying, uh, taxing um, heavy bottles are some of the ideas I took from here. What we're going to do from here is we are going to, we have already gathered a list of sources and information that we will be sharing uh, from tomorrow onwards. This talk will also be available on podcast and on YouTube, so you can listen to it. We'll also make a transcript and we will send the questions that remain unanswered to our panelists. So hopefully we'll ask for their patience to come back to us with answers. Thank you all very much. I hope this you all loved it and it was useful. I have a lot of questions. We got a lot of answers. But this, this is the, the we, we are, there's so many answers, but more than answers, I think we have the alternatives. And I think what we listened here today is that all the alternatives are valuable and probably heavy glass will still be used for certain wines, but there is space and the consumer is open if we just educate him to have a lighter bottle, to have PET recycled. I also have frugal pack here, by the way. This is not advertising, I wish we had, Glass and wine, scans everything, reusable bottles. There's a space for all. Now, thank you very much, everyone. Our climate talks will continue. We have a full month of May. Actually, on the 29th of April, we'll have another business sense of internalizing climate change. Stay tuned because we'll unveil the guests in a couple of days. In May, and Jan, as you mentioned, Richard, uh, Dr. Richard Smart, he will be organizing, he'll be mentoring uh, a special edition, edition from Australia, where again, not only, but this topic of packaging will also be uh, touched and, and then we will have more to come. Please join us. We would love to continue this conversation with you. And again, thank you everyone on the other side of the screen and on uh, our panel. We ask our panelists not to leave so we can say goodbye and thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Actually, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Marta, okay, Marta, no, that. there's a... There was a text here from uh, a message from Christian, an owner of Napa Valley Wine Academy. He wanted yeah. me to make a dad joke and I, I didn't even get a chance. I couldn't make, I wanted to make a sweetest joke. There's no way I could finish it before the time was up. <laughs> Thanks, <You> Christian. Did. <laughs> and Martin, you are a poet. Thank you for being part of Everybody. this discussion <laughs> and for helping us. All right, bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I'm trying.